it is our pleasure to be joined by undoubtedly the hardest working man at Soonerscoop.com. Josh <laughs> McQuiston is in the house. What's going on, big guy? Not a lot, guys. You know, uh, just this feels like the minute you get to breathe, but do, getting to do this with you guys, I mean, there is, it, it's, it's Christmas is here now. Like, this is when I actually get to think about hanging out with my family at some point over the next week. It's hard to, I, I always wonder, does it get harder every year? Does it get easier every year? Or is it just who even knows anymore? <laughs> I think I got to thank Brent a little bit because, I mean, they were 27 for 27 yesterday, and Taylor Tatum was the only moment that anybody was even sweating for a second. So, like, that's that's better. I mean, usually there's that one stray guy where you're like, I got to chase down his uncle or his grandfather and find out what's happening. But, man, that was that was easy yesterday. So that that wasn't too bad. But as I say, that next year will be a nightmare. I mean, that's just the way it always goes. <laughs> Yeah, that is, that's typically how it goes. Now, I think the best way to do this, as opposed to going through all 27 guys, is just kind of hit some broad questions and and see where it takes us. So let's start with a, a simple yet complex question. Your favorite player in OU's 2024 recruiting class? You guys know me. I'm a recruiting guy by nature. I have to, I, I just, I look at measurables and things like that. Danny Okoye fascinates me like just the the potential he has and to land him following PJ out of bar away like y you there's so much there I mean like there, there is so much there and guys the question that you had was well what's it going to look like when he faces real guys and we saw him in the army bowl earlier this week I think the consensus by everybody there he was the best player on the field and that's that's not the Under Armour game. That's not the All-American Bowl in San Antonio. Like, the, it's a fall off in talent, but it's a big step up, and he didn't look bothered by it at all. So I, I think I'm pretty fascinated with what he could be. And uh, for people that would say, oh, he's a homeschool kid, stand next to Danny Okoye. Like, he is 240, and I can't think of a better way to say it than he looks carved out of wood. Like, this is a guy that lives in the weight room, and I just don't think he's going to have the – the problem physically now obviously there's a lot to mentally learn and there it's it is a big jump i get it, 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 it there's going to be growing pains but i don't think it's as drastic as people think it's going to be the homeschool thing is funny to me right you know an athlete when you see it uh, why do i care if, if he's ever even played football before you know high school football and college football aren't even really the same sport but you know it's kind of interesting when since coach venables came there's been a heavy effort to recruit in state and it's crazy that the talent in state feels like it's getting better and better. I mean, Danny Okoye and I know David Stone played in IMG, but he's an Oklahoma kid and there's other great guys in this class. And it also feels like next year's class of Oklahoma players is going to be really strong too. It's kind of been wild the last couple of years. Yeah, I mean, and even as you go deeper, like you look at the sophomore class, there's already multiple guys with Power 5 offers, including a couple of guys that have OU offers in that 26th class. So I, it is, it's a kind of an interesting chicken of the egg. Like, is there better talent these next few years, or is Oklahoma giving these guys a little notoriety, a little shine, whatever you want to call it? Is that leading to more people kind of scouring the state and saying, oh, there's guys here who can play? Um, but yeah, I, guys, I mean, we're all Oklahomans. We're counting David Stone. He, he's one of us. He, he, he's part of that, that deal. So we get to claim him. And, you know, and David all along has been like, I'm coming home. Like, I mean, like he talks about it in that same terminology. So I, I do. I think this has been really good. I, I've said before, I think 2025, the, you know, for those not familiar with these numbers and don't think about this garbage all day like I do, uh, the, the upcoming junior class is probably as good as I've seen it in Oklahoma since that, um, that 06 class, it was like Bradford, McCoy, Gresham, all those guys. Now I'm not saying it's that good, but it's the best I've seen since that group. Uh, let's stick with the, the in-state recruiting stuff real quick. How different is it from what you're hearing from these prospects? I, I mean, how how different is it under Venables than it was under Riley and even under Bob late in his tenure? 
You know, part of it is the players, but their their perspective is is different because they only know this world. Like they only know how it is to deal with these guys. When I talk to the coaches, that's the thing you notice. And it's something where it's very much a, you know, guys didn't come by every year unless there was a guy. And I mean, I'm talking even major 6A Oklahoma City area programs that, that would have been an easy stop for a lot of schools. I thought largely, and I, and I do want to say like a guy like Brian Odom previously, I thought Brian did a nice job in state and I want to give him his credit. But a lot of times previously in state, unless there was a guy there that was on OU's radar, Oklahoma wasn't making a real effort to get by. Now they might stop by for a quick pop in kind of a hi, how are you? That kind of thing. But they weren't sitting down and talking to these coaches and being, you know, what we all know Brent says relational all the time, like making sure those coaches are familiar because that's when you get into these scenarios where there's these guys that aren't that well known. Cause I mean, people forget Danny Okoye, you know, wasn't the guy that everybody knew as a sophomore. He was a homeschool kid that frankly had a teammate that was being more well recruited early on than Danny was. So um, I, I think that is what you see. And you get these coaches saying, Hey, you know, whoever his area guy is, whether, you know, it's, it's Brent that saw him most recently, or whether it's Ted Roof or someone like that, they say, Hey coach, we saw this guy last Friday night. Maybe you should, you know, take a look at that huddle, look at his film and see what you think. And that's how you get those kind of heads up on guys, whether they're scholarship guys or preferred walk-on types. I mean, you, you, you're building that roster all the time. And we all know when it comes to those PWOs, the guys like Andy Bass from uh, heritage hall and Bergen Kaiser from Santa Fe, those guys, get you know they help your roster be better and deeper and for Oklahoma to land those guys has a lot to do with them putting a focus on those players early on you know one of the other things that w when coach Venables made it here got here and w was talking recruiting it sent people into a tailspin was the if if you're committed and you take a visit elsewhere you're no longer committed. It it feels like, as you pointed out, 27 for 27 yesterday, not a lot of drama. And I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but it feels like uh, most people thought that that was a disaster of a thing to say, but it feels like it's working out just fine. Teddy, I don't know if you looked at my timeline yesterday, but there are people <laughs> cheering you for bringing this up with me right now because I, I was on it yesterday. I said something unrelated, and somebody's like, well, what about the no-visit policy? You hated that. And I was like, that doesn't have anything to do with this. So we'll dive into this. But no, I am not a huge fan of it. I won't lie. But at the same time, you can't argue. I mean, like, I, I'm not denying at all that there are fewer decommitments. There just are. When you look at... 2019 and 2020, I, I did the numbers yesterday. I think there were 17 decommitments between those two classes. Now, a couple of the guys came back. A couple of them, I think, were just kind of processed. They just weren't guys that OU felt advanced as seniors like they hoped they would. So there's some mitigating circumstances, but there's no question. There are fewer guys decommitting, and I, I think that is that's definitely has to do with the system because you are – you have this idea of don't commit until you're ready. And that's, that's great. Like, I, I think that is, that's perfectly sensible. And it's going to add up to these numbers. My issue always was if you turn away a guy that's ready to pull that trigger, you can't sign before you commit. So I'm always a fan of just let them commit. And then you're going to have to recruit them really hard either way. So like, I, I just kind of felt like it's one of those things where it sounds good. Like I, I, I get the idea but it doesn't change anything for the coaches. So it just feels like one of those things where you get to say it's a victory, but I don't know. But there, but at the same time, there's no denying that it has slowed the decommitments in Oklahoma having to jumble their numbers, you know, into December. Looking at the O-line and D-line, we all know where this program is headed and what it's all about in the SEC. Who's your favorite O-lineman? in this class i i want to say i have listened to you guys last week and you are not wrong eddie pierre louise and i i said this on our pod yesterday 
I think Brent really threaded that needle beautifully because we've all talked about Louis or Lewis, which one it is. And he kind of threw the Louis and on the end of it. And I was like, well, that just married all of it. That's perfect. <laughs> so we, we all can just kind of live with the, the middle ground there. But um, guys, uh, he's a guy I saw as a junior, incredibly violent, like just physical when he finishes. I mean, this is a guy that makes all the sense in the world for Bill Beatonbow. Like we know what he likes and he likes these kind of guys. And then when you watch him run in space and you're like, that's not normal. Like guys don't move like that. And I can tell you as someone who has stood next to Eddie, the six, three, three thirty, that's legit. He's a big boy. This isn't like a guy that, Oh, he moves that well, but you find out he's two ninety. Like that, that is a big, big dude. And for Oklahoma to have fought their way through to get him at the end, I, I think he's a, Really, the only thing you could say is you wish he was coming in at semester. You wish that was that was possible and really add some depth and, you know, some talent to that interior of the offensive line. But to me, he's the guy you like. Uh, I love Daniel Akinkunmi. I think he may – I could argue that he might have the most upside of any of them, but I think he's got the farthest to go. So there's there's kind of that, you know, high ceiling, low floor kind of scenario. He does have an the- awesome accent, which I don't know – how much that means but it means something josh it, well people I, are gonna listen anything, right? anything better than getting pancaked and then a guy in a british accent uh talking trash to you it's just not gonna it, it's not normal but it'll be great especially in the south that's gonna be cool he's got to have something about like tea and crackers or something like something every time he body bags <laughs> a, a, a little Southern American kid and just like destroys him. That, that would be perfect just to only add shame to it. How about the, the wide receivers? I think it's, it's funny yesterday when we were doing the signing day show up at the noun, I was looking at the, the list of players and you had right next to each other. You had a six, six wide receiver. And you had like a five eight or five nine KJ Daniels, uh, smaller guy, but he's a burner. So I mean, there's like some different body types in there, makes it pretty cool. It, there really is, because you look at that receiver room, and I, you know, I, I I've said it before, maybe with you guys, uh, Bucky Brooks, guy that does a lot of the work for the NFL Network, like he talks about the receiver room kind of being like a basketball team, and and that's you know you've got your point guards, you've got your power forwards, all that kind of stuff, and that's what Oklahoma did here. Uh, you know, you look at. Zion Raggins, who's probably five, seven and a half, five, eight little guy, but legitimately like 10, 300 speed. Like he can fly. He, he, he looks uh, when you watch him on tape. I I mean, it's silly to compare people to Hollywood Brown with the production he had, but that's exactly what he looks like when you watch. You're not wrong. Like 100% that, that is who he reminds you of from his size, from his frame Uh, and, and talking to his coach last year, I think he twisted his ankle at some point, like a month out from state finals. So he won't get to be basically a four time, 100 meter state champion in Georgia. But I mean, he's almost a shoe in to be a three time. And and I think last year with an ankle, he still ran like 10, five, five or something. Like, I mean, it still was, I mean, just insane. So, um, he, he's, uh, he's really exciting to watch. KJ Daniels has a lot of speed, but I think is a little bit more of, Almost your traditional slot guy going to, you know, be very good dragging across the middle, going to do stuff after the catch. Like you you like a lot that he brings. Zion Kearney is kind of the jewel of the group and he is 6'2", 205. I mean, like uh, just a big, impressive looking guy and, you know, um, comes from, you know, the same area of Houston as guys like Kenneth Murray, C.D. Lamb, like you name that kind of Southwest Houston area. And he brings a lot to the table. And again, it's another guy had an ankle injury this year, fought back, had a touchdown in the state quarterfinals, nearly pushed Hightower into uh, the state semis in Texas. So uh, he is, he's an outstanding talent. And Ivan Carrion is really interesting. Um, He's a guy that I saw on an off night. I mean, Ivan and I did an interview afterwards. It was kind of like, you know, what do we talk about here? Because it just wasn't the night he would have wanted to have. Had a couple drops and just wasn't really on his game. Um, But at the same time, this is a guy that Emmett Jones had at Texas Tech, brought him to Oklahoma. This is a guy Emmett Jones believes in. I mean, and that's what I kind of keep coming back to as well as I've seen Emmett Jones recruit, both in the portal, in recruiting, everything we could see him do, he has been outstanding at talent acquisition. So for him to say, I'm going to stand on this guy, I believe in Ivan Carrion, 
it says a lot. Like it says that that guy, he really thinks there's something special there. No, looking. Uh, oh. No, you go ahead, Ted. No, sorry, I'm 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 out of order. <laughs> sorry, no, yeah. you can you can ask your follow up. Okay. I well, it, it's not really a follow up. It was, I whenever you look at the needs on the team, and and what they got in this kid, I think Devon Mitchell may be. Uh, that may be the gem of the entire class, offensive defense, just because like we got to have someone at that spot. Guys, it, you know, if you wanted to ask the question of who is the most likely guy of this class to start an opening day, it's Devon Mitchell. Like, th there's no question based on what's there, and that guys, we're, we we all forget he should just be going. He be, should be in the middle of his junior year of high school. Like, this is a kid that's going to be a year early anyway. And he is so big and so physical. Now, he's going to have to put in a lot of work in the weight room. You know, you go to a place like Allen, and there is a lot of development. He spent the last year at Los Al uh, due to Malachi Nelson and Makai Lemon and all the guys. I've spent a lot of time around Los Al over the last four or five years. It's different in Southern California. The, the, unless you're Modern Day or Bosco, the attention to the weight room and those sort of things, it's just not the same. It's not pushed all the time, and that's not a fault of the guys at Low Sal. It's just a different mindset. It is, and that was something Devon and I talked about when I went out and saw him this season was just kind of like, uh, I have to make sure I stay locked in because it's easy to get distracted and do other things, which is a little different from a Texas powerhouse like Allen and some of those schools that just football all the time. So I, I think that's going to be really interesting how he – immediately gets into the weight room with Jerry Schmidt, how he does that work. But the physical talent, I, I've said it before, and this is no offense to a tight end from Bishop McGinnis, but the three best tight ends I've covered doing this were Jermaine Gresham, Mark Andrews, and Devon Mitchell, as far as guys that ended up in Oklahoma. So you're talking about pretty rare air there, and he he has a chance to be a, you know, a, a future, uh, I guess, a lofty NFL draft pick someday. Josh, you do you do a really good job of you know breaking down what happens on the field on Saturdays for OU. And I think we can all agree the running back position needs to be more dynamic. Is is Tatum the type of guy you could see being a factor the second he steps on campus? I think when he walks on campus, he is the most talented running back Oklahoma has. Now does that mean he's ready to go? I don't know. What I can say is a program like Longview, they don't mess around. They know what they're doing. That's a tough program. It's not going to shock him, the work he has to put in. Like John King, uh, you know, uh, for those that remember Haynes King at Texas A&M, John King is his father, has been the coach at Longview forever. That dude does not run a loose ship. Like they, they, they do things the right way, and there's a reason Longview is always very, very good. Um, so I, I think to me, it's just a matter of what kind of shape does he arrive in since he, we know he won't be enrolling at semester. He's going to have to stay on it because he's be do he'll be doing baseball all spring. And, you know, for those that don't recognize it, this isn't a token thing. Oklahoma baseball is very excited about Taylor Tatum. They think he is a special, special guy. Um, so if he can come in and he can pick up the things and we, and guys, we all saw it last year. We know DeMarco's not going to put him out there. If he's not ready, can't do all the little things that you have to do to be a quality player at Oklahoma or to be at OU's level. I, he won't, he won't be out there, but from a physical, just, he has the instincts and knows how to run and does the little things. Taylor Tatum's the most talented back. I think they've signed in a while. Like he, he is truly, a special guy and they can throw the ball to him. He's big enough to handle the stuff between the tackles. He's um, he's just very, very gifted. Yeah. Um, this D line group. I know we talked about Okoye a little bit, but uh, just overall, what do you think? Um, it's got to be one of the better halls that they've signed in a while on the defensive line as a group. And I mean, you got some different body types in there. It looks pretty solid. Yeah. I, I was talk guys. I, I think what's amazing when you look at this D line group is I don't know that Todd Bates and Miguel Chavis even realize how drastically they've changed the narrative and what a short amount of time they, they were both down there at Nigel Smith when he announced uh, prior to the first ho uh, high school home game at Melissa. And, you know, of course I'm down there covering his announcement and that sort of stuff. And 
I, I just kind of threw out, hey, guys, the previous 10 years before they got there, if I remember the numbers right, Oklahoma had signed one or two top 100 defensive linemen. In the last two classes, they've signed four. And that just, you're like, the, the numbers there and what you're doing to not only change what Oklahoma is going to be going forward, but to do it without any real backing, guys. I mean, the last time Oklahoma had a first-round draft pick, which is what a lot of these kids look at. I know people want to say, well, how great are they going to be at OU? These kids want to know if they've got a chance to go to the NFL. And for, for these guys, there's no track record since Gerald McCoy in, in 2010. So I think it's amazing what they've been able to say of, look what we did at Clemson. We're going to do it here at Oklahoma and make that pitch to these guys. So I, I think that's just incredible. And yeah, I mean, Danny Okoye, David Stone, Nigel Smith, those are uh, those are huge wins. I mean, they beat Ohio State for Nigel Smith. Danny Okoye was Texas, Tennessee, LSU. I mean, he could have gone a lot of places. David Stone could have went anywhere he wanted to go. So these aren't just guys where you know kind of you kind of say, oh yeah, they they kind of fell into a good spot there, and there wasn't a lot of competition. These are guys that everybody wanted. So I think that's huge. And the two guys that get overlooked, White Gilmore is going to be a good football player. He is physical. He's tough. Um, really sets the edge well. I, I, I like him as a kind of strong side defensive end. You see him playing at like 265, 270, being a big, powerful guy. Got a, He's huge shoulders, just a big, broad guy. Um, and then Jaden Jackson. Guys, there are a lot of years where Jaden Jackson would be the best defensive lineman OU signed, and they'd be pretty happy to have done it. So for him to come in and just be a future bowling ball of a nose tackle, it's just a huge win for OU. Seven defensive backs in the class, Powers, Hardy, Newcomb, Boganowski, Jordan Bowen, and Patterson McDonald. W which guys really stood out to you as you were evaluating him? For me, it's Reggie Powers. I, I watch him, and I see a very complete safety. I see a guy that can drop off, play man. He can play in zone. But then when you watch him come up and play downhill, he is violent. I mean, th there's a lot you like about his game. Uh, you know, I, I had someone kind of say, well, you know, compare him to like Billy out of high school. Billy was more of a natural playmaker, which we've all seen. I mean, Billy is just around the ball. He's constant. Um, I don't know that Reggie has quite that level, but he's more physically gifted. I mean, he is six foot, 185, uh, runs very well. I mean, th th there's there's not really a hole in his game. I, I would kind of say he's almost a safety version of Taylor Tatum where maybe there's not that one thing that screams at me, but he's really good at all of it. So I, I just like his game a lot. Uh, and, and a fun note, distantly related to John Legend. So that that's kind of a, a fun little Reggie Powers note there. But, um, you know, just a really interesting guy. Boganowski, that's one of those guys that, uh, you know, and I think I talked about this last year with some of the guys they had brought in. He is as good as Brent is creative, and we know that's not a problem. So... I just, there's a lot of ways you could use him. He could grow into a linebacker. He could play a pure cheetah. I think they're going to start him as a true safety and just kind of see where that takes him. But I mean, this is a 6'2", 205 pound kid that will light you up across the middle. Uh, Eddie and George, our guys went and saw him in a playoff game right before the um, before the Kansas game that we don't want to talk about. But, you know, he he played really well that night and we had just, just him knocking poor Kansas kids head off. I mean, it was just violent all the time. And so I, those two really stick out to me. Um, but it's hard to listen to BB talk about Eli Bowen and not be like, okay, Oklahoma's really got something here. They, that was something I heard all throughout Peyton Bowen's recruitment was Eli has nothing to do with Peyton. They wanted Eli Bowen. If Peyton would have gone to Oregon or Notre Dame or wherever it was, they still would have hoped to sign Eli in this class because He's kind of like I talked about with Billy. He's just constantly around the ball, breaking up passes, getting into running lanes. And when he catches the ball, he's picked off a couple. I think he had two two or three pick sixes this year. So, I mean, just a, just a dominant player with the ball in his hands. Now, we heard, I think Coach Venable said, uh, maybe, I don't know if it was yesterday or or leading into it, that they hope to sign 27 or 28 guys is this class done i know signing day was yesterday but you know you could still sign guys for what another couple of months are we done with this thing 
they have got two at this point. Now, you never know. Sometimes there's a there's a guy that OU thought, okay, he's going to sign with Alabama or he's going to sign with whoever it may be, whoever they kind of had an eye on. And then maybe somebody leaves in the portal and they kind of say, okay, we've got a spot, you know, we've got an open roster spot at that kid's position. There, so there are variables that could happen, but I really think there are two guys they're still seriously involved with. And that's Dominic McKinley, the fig five-star defensive lineman from Louisiana. We all remember, really think, oh, you came in second with him to Texas A&M the first time around. And uh, with all the change at A&M, he kind of has reopened it, but has really stayed committed and kind of says he's going to stick with A&M. Um, we'll see. He's not signing in this early period from everything we've gathered. That's what his mother has told some people at, at On3, the network I work for. And so I, we'll see. I, I, I think it's possible. But the problem for OU there is they've already used their official visit and Brent Venables has already done his in-home. That's kind of your your big punch in December or January, whatever it is, is to have that in-home visit with the head coach. And Oklahoma's already done that, so I don't know what moves they still have to make unless they can get him back up to campus. The other one that's interesting is D'Alen Evans, a uh, uh, kid from Texas, Longview Pine Tree. Uh, in spite of being from Longview, the guy that he's connected to in the class is not Taylor Tatum. But instead, uh, Nigel Smith, the big defensive lineman from Melissa, they are good friends. Nigel's talking to him. Uh, I think a, an official visit in January is very possible. Uh, and from there, anything could happen. This is another guy, longtime A&M commitment, just kind of decided not to sign. He's going to look around. Um, you hear some Texas buzz right now, but I don't think anything is set with him. And if there was one of the two I thought, oh, you could maybe really shock some people with, I would probably say it's Evans. Is is the biggest compliment we can give Jackson Arnold the fact that we haven't talked about the two quarterbacks coming in? <laughs> that that's, that's usually not how it goes, Josh. Yeah, usually that's all we want to talk about. I mean, even Jackson last year, we we knew we knew Dylan was coming back. We knew Jackson had been committed for months, and still everybody wanted to talk about the five star quarterback. So you, you're right, but you look at these two guys. I mean. From a production standpoint, it's hard to find much issue. Between the two of them, they basically averaged 1,000 yards rushing. So these guys are very good athletes. Uh, Brendan Zerberg, I know a lot of people kind of think, oh, he's an Ohio kid. He's, you know, it's Kirk Herbstreit out there. No, that's not what it is. I mean, th this guy ran for, ran for over 1,000 yards in 11 games this year. And, you know, I think it was like 27 to 4 with its touchdown to interception ratio. Uh, just a very solid player. I really liked that evaluation from Jeff Levy. You know, we want to give him his credit for really chasing that guy down when not a lot of people were talking about the kid. But I, I thought that was a really good find, really gives Oklahoma some nice nice depth at quarterback. And then you get to Michael Hawkins, who had 52 touchdowns this year, took his team to the state semifinals, and really gave South Oak Cliff a lot. Like, th there was a lot of thought, and I, I certainly was one of them, that that was going to be a real problem. And you know, who who had Emerson played to that point, but they played South Oak Cliff tough. And South Oak Cliff was two-time defending state champion, is full of Division One athletes. So I, I really was impressed with that. And I, the biggest thing I noticed, guys, his junior year, his completion percentage was around 56%. It jumped to 69% his senior year. And I thought that was a real telling indication of him still growing as a passer. Because if there's anything I would question about Mike, it's just that accuracy. How consistent can he be? Because sometimes his mechanics are not always repeated. He can get a little off. And I think that can hurt him at times. And I thought this year he looked much cleaner. So, I, again, I, I think Oklahoma did a nice job holding off some schools. I had heard Arkansas tried to make a late run. Um, you know, so, I, I, again, I think that's a – it's it's telling for Jackson Arnold, but at the same time, I don't want those guys to be seen as, you know, they can't be quality players because if either one of them became a starter someday, I don't think anyone should be shocked. Impossible to do, but whenever you, you know, take the class as a whole, how do you compare it to, you know, some of the recent highly ranked classes that we've had? I think it stands up right there next to last year. It's a little different because there's not as much star power. There's not the Peyton Bowen. There's not the Jackson Arnold, the, the PJ. You really have David. And I, I put Danny in that caliber. I, I think Danny's a top 50 guy in the country, regardless of how our side or any other network ranks him. Like, I, I think he is a truly special talent. The declassification, 
mm-hmm. for uh, Devon Mitchell like that. Yeah. I mean, it took him from being like, wow, five star, amazing. And then all of a sudden it's like no one talks about him. Absolutely. And and, and I agree. And I think I, the question for me is the depth of the two is which one I like better. To me, I probably lean just a little bit to 2024 because of the defensive line. And I know how rare that is. And I know how hard it is to get those guys. Um, Oklahoma's never had a problem landing elite quarterbacks. They've landed elite safeties in the recent, you know, in, in years past. Um, so to me, just having those bodies up front. Now, if Oklahoma could have landed like a Grant Bricks, like just one more offensive lineman that really has some really high end potential. I think I'd be all in on 24, but it's really close. Like, and I, I heard Brent's comment, like, you know, kind of considering this one is best one yet. And, you know, who knows how much he's really considered that, you know, I, I don't think coaches spend a lot of time thinking about it in those terms. Um, but it, it's a close argument and there's no question. It's one of the better classes I've seen OU sign in the last decade. So all I know is the last three years and really primarily the last two, you've seen the talent get much better in North. All right, last question, and it's prediction time, Josh. <laughs> highly two two parter for you. Number one, right. really highly ranked guy that you think is a sure thing. Number two, lower ranked guy that you think could be end up being an all conference, all American, like really really successful player. I would say, and it depends on how far you want to go down the list on, you know, highly ranked player, but as far as like four star above that kind of thing, I would say Reggie powers. If there was a guy I was going to say, I'm going to bet my bottom dollar. This guy is going to be a really good football player. I have very few questions. It's Reggie powers because he gets it from a mental standpoint. He's physically gifted and he comes from a good program. There's just not a lot of variables with him. Now, how good he's going to be, we, we can have that conversation. But I just think he is one of those guys that has a very high floor. I don't expect him to have a lot of problems. And I wouldn't be shocked at all if he has a considerable role this year, whether it's as a, a cheetah, as a backup, or you know, just finding ways to get him on the field when they can. Um, as far as a lower-ranked guy that I think could go on and be a really good player, I would probably say, and I'm kind of torn between an offensive lineman and a defensive lineman, but since I've been tough on the offensive line, I'll say Daniel Akinkumi. I I just think there's a lot there. He's going to need time. People are going to have to be patient with him. But you watch this kid at some of the camps where he's faced some elite guys. And I know camps are camps. I understand. But he's physically overwhelmed some people. And you're just like, he doesn't know what he's doing yet. And there's so much still to learn. And Daniel... I, Daniel may see this and he will bristle because he's like, I've been coached, you know, like he, he takes it very seriously. And I think that's part of why I buy into him because he's very intentional about his work, what he thinks he wants to be like, you know, after the whole Caden green thing, he tweeted out, like, I'm, I'm just trying to go to the NFL. I don't care about all that stuff. You know, it's some of the things that we know have been rumored. So he is, he's a guy that's about the work and that's the kind of guy that bill tends to have a lot of success with. And I look at his raw tools, his size, and I I just think he's incredibly interesting to see what he could become. Nice. I like it. Well, we'll have to have you on again soon to talk some OU basketball. We ran out of time, unfortunately, <laughs> in, in this one. But you, you're what makes Sooner Scoop go, man. Keep doing your thing. We appreciate you. Hey, guys, anytime. Enjoy it.